Hi, in this episode of How We Got Here, we're going to look at Israel and its enemies in depth. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire dissolved. In 1917, the British issued the Balfour Declaration, giving Jews a home in their ancient land. The Arab Sharif of Mecca, al-Hashimi, who helped the British defeat the Ottomans, saw the British recognize his sons, Fazl, as king of Iraq and Abdullah as king of Jordan. The moderate Sharif balked on concessions to the British, and as a result, the British withheld support, allowing the fundamentalist Wahhabi leader Abdul Aziz ibn Saad to seize control of Arabia in 1924. Wahhabis were Islamic revivalists. Lawrence of Arabia described them in the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, 1922. The Wahhabis, followers of a fanatical Muslim heresy, had imposed their strict rules. Everything was forcibly pious or forcibly puritanical. Brookings Institute scholar William McCants wrote, Saudis promote a very toxic form of Islam that draws sharp lines between a small number of true believers and everyone else, Muslim and non-Muslim. In other words, Wahhabis are just as apt to kill a moderate Muslim as they are to kill a non-Muslim. Wahhabi follow Salafi teachings of a harsh literal interpretation of the Quran with a goal of a one-world Islamic government called the Caliphate. The British allowing Aziz ibn Saud to take over Arabia affected the world in two ways. Since Mecca is in Arabia and one of the five pillars of Islam is to make a pilgrimage there called the Hajj, Muslims from around the world were now coming to Mecca and getting infected with Wahhabism. All modern terrorist organizations can trace their origins to Wahhabi, such as the Muslim Brotherhood founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna and six workers of the British-run Suez Canal Company. The Muslim Brotherhood stated, Jihad is our way. Death for the sake of Allah is the highest of our aspirations. The second way Saudi control of Arabia affected the world was oil. In 1937, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company discovered oil in Saudi Arabia. In one generation, it went from the poorest Muslim country to the richest, becoming a magnet for Wahhabism. And with its newfound wealth, it bribed Western businesses and politicians. A person who went on pilgrimage to Mecca was the Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al Husseini. Hitler originally expelled Jews from Germany, and some arrived in Jerusalem. The Mufti did not like this. He met with Hitler to confirm their mutual hatred of Jews. He raised Arab troops to join the Nazis and pressured Hitler to commit to elimination of the Jewish national home, thus supporting the final solution of the Holocaust. When Hitler lost the war, the Mufti fled to King Farouk in Egypt in 1946, where he made an alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood. The British grew tired of Middle East tensions and announced to the world that they would re relinquish the British mandate on May 15, 1948. Israel declared its independence and with the help of President Truman was recognized by the United Nations. That very day, the first Arab-Israeli conflict began. It ended with a treaty negotiated by Ralph Bunch, the first African-American to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. In the Cold War, Soviets took advantage of internal divisions within countries to overthrow governments, a process called critical race theory. The CIA copied these Soviet KGB tactics. In 1952, the CIA participated in Project FF, overthrowing King Farouk in the Egyptian Revolution and installing Gamal Nasser. In 1953, the CIA helped overthrow Mossadegh in Iran and install the pro-American Shah Reza Pahlavi. In 1956, Nasser had Egypt take control of the Suez Canal, which connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. It was built at great expense by the French, 1859 to 69, then managed by the British since 18. 1882, who defended it during World Wars I and II. Nasser refused to pay Britain or France and blocked Israeli ships. In response, Britain and France and Israel invaded and took back the canal and the Sinai Peninsula. When Nasser made overtures of aligning Egypt with the Soviet Union, 
Britain and France withdrew, leaving Israel in control. In 1957, President Eisenhower pressured Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion to give up the Sinai Peninsula in a land for peace promise. The UN then engaged in its first peacekeeping mission with UN troops guarding the Suez Canal. The Soviets helped create the Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1964. The Mufti of Jerusalem's nephew, Yasser Arafat, became the head of the PLO. Soviets helped Fidel Castro create unrest and overthrow Batista in Cuba. Soviets helped create unrest in Colombia with the National Liberation Army of Colombia, FARC. Soviets created unrest in Bolivia by helping Ernesto Che Guevara found the National Liberation Army of Bolivia, ELN. Soviets created liberation theology to promote Marxist social justice among naive students on college campuses. Eisenhower confided June 10, 1963. The United Nations seems to be two distinct things. To the free world, it seems it should be a constructive forum. To the communist world, it has been a convenient sounding board for their propaganda, a weapon to be exploited in spreading disunity and confusion. On June 5th, 1967, Nasser prepared Egypt to attack Israel in the Six-Day War. Cairo Radio announced, the hour has come in which we shall destroy Israel. Jordan and Syria used Soviet-made weapons to shell Jerusalem and Israeli villages. The hotline between Washington and Moscow was used for the first time. Israel's foreign minister, Abba Ivan, addressed the United Nations June 6, 1967. An army greater than any force ever assembled in history in Sinai has massed against Israel's southern frontier. Egypt has dismissed United Nations forces, which symbolize the international interest in the maintenance of peace. Nasser had provocatively brought five infantry divisions and two armored divisions to our very gates. 80,000 men and 900 tanks were poised to move. In a surprise move, Israeli Air Force flew under the radar and destroyed 400 Egyptian planes. Sarah Yadaved Rigler wrote in Hidden Miracles, February 2nd, 2003, how there was an intelligence problem for the Egyptians. On the morning of June 5th, 1967, Egyptian intelligence sent warnings of Israel's attack to Egypt's command bunker at Cairo, but the commander could not be found. The previous night, he and his officers were at an air base in Egypt's North Delta attending a party with a famous belly dancer, and early the next morning were meeting with high-ranking delegation from Iraq. As a result, not one senior Egyptian officer was at his post when the Israeli airstrike occurred. Israelis retook the Sinai Peninsula and drove Syria from the Golan Heights and captured Jerusalem, including the West Bank, the Old City, and the Temple Mount. In a CBS TV interview, Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion stated, In Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. Israeli commander Mata Gur told his brigade, upon recapturing Jerusalem's old city. For some 2,000 years, the Temple Mount was forbidden to Jews until you came, you, the paratroopers, and returned it to the bosom of the nation. The Western Wall, for which every heart beats, is ours once again. You have been given the great privilege of completing the circle, on, of returning to the nation its capital and its holy center. Jerusalem is yours forever. Israeli Prime Minister of Defense Moshe Dayan, in an act of land for peace, ordered the Israeli flag which soldiers had raised over the Temple Mount to be removed, leaving Muslims in charge of the holy site. After Nasser died in 1970, Anwar Sadat became president of Egypt. In 1973, during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, Egypt and Syria launched attacks on Israel in the Yom Kippur War. The U.S. and Soviets supplied opposite sides, almost erupting in a direct confrontation. The Yom Kippur ended with a ceasefire October 25, 1973. President Jimmy Carter brokered the Camp David Accords in 1978, in which Israel agreed to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula and participate in a land-for-peace process. 
both Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Egyptian President Anwar Sadat were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The Egyptian Islamic Jihad assassinated Sadat for making a treaty with the Jews and then wounded Egypt's next president, Hosni Mubarak, in the year 1981. Well, another part of what was going on in the Middle East was in 1979, President Jimmy Carter abandoned America's ally, the Shah of Iran. This allowed the fundamentalist Ayatollah Khomeini to seize power in Iran and switched Iran from pro-America to death to America. Soon after Khomeini seized power, he helped found Hezbollah in Lebanon. In 1981, Muslim terrorists blew up the U.S. Marine barracks in Lebanon. The U.S. response was to withdraw. During the Iran-Iraq War in 1980 to 1988, President Reagan had the U.S. support Saddam Hussein and, and support Iraq against Iran's fundamentalist Ayatollah Khomeini. Richard Aldrich described in The Guardian, in the 1980s, Washington's secret services had assisted Saddam Hussein in his war against Iran. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush ended U.S. support for Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War. During the Soviet-Afghan War, 1979 to 1989, the CIA conducted Operation Cyclone, its largest covert operation supplying arms and training to the Taliban Islamist Afghan Mujahideen fighters. Sylvester Stallone did a movie in 1988 about it called Rambo III, and Tom Hanks did a movie about this, Charlie Wilson's War, in 2007. One of those who was working with the U.S.-backed Taliban was Osama bin Laden, who founded Al-Qaeda in 1988. Hamas was founded in 1985 out of the Muslim Brotherhood. In 1995, Bill Clinton was running for re-election, and Monica Lewinsky's scandal broke. And Clinton in the midst of this, fired cruise missiles into Serbia in Operation Deliberate Force and smuggled U.S. weapons through Iran to support the Bosnian Muslim KLA, Kosovo Liberation Army, against the Orthodox Christian Serbs. Richard Aldrich wrote in The Guardian, April 21, 2002, America used Islamists to arm the Bosnian Muslims. Well, the story goes on. Over one million ethnic Albanians were driven from Kosovo. The war ended with Bill Clinton signing the Dayton Agreement, November 1995. And in gratitude, Kosovo's now Muslim capital city of Pristina erected a statue of Bill Clinton on Bill Clinton Boulevard. The timing of the war's distraction from the Lewinsky scandal was the theme of the 1997 movie Wag the Dog, starring Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro. President George W. Bush invaded Iraq in 2003 and removed Saddam Hussein in the Second Gulf War. Afterwards, the Islamic State of Iraq, which turned into ISIS, grew in power, aligning itself with the Al-Qaeda. David Kilkulin, former chief strategist in the State Department's Office of the Coordinator of Counterterrorism, said, there undeniably would be no ISIS if we had not invaded Iraq. Al-Shabaab was founded in Somalia in 2006, aligning with Al-Qaeda. The Boko Haram was founded in Nigeria in 2002, aligning with ISIS. In 2005, President Bush and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice pressured Israel to give up Gaza in a land for peace promise. President Obama supported the Muslim Brotherhood's ousting of Egypt's President Mubarak. Reuters ran the headline January 31st, 2011, Israel shocked by Obama's betrayal of Mubarak. U.S. weapons were used to oust Libya's President Gaddafi. Reuters reported on March 25th, 2011, U.S. mainly using precision weapons in Libya. In 2011, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton 
joined with 57 other leaders of the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, to support a UN resolution prohibiting anyone from insulting Islam, effectively abolishing free speech worldwide by placing non-Muslims in a dimmy status. On September 11, 2012, a plane attacked um, a plan, a planned attack on September 11, 2012, a planned attack began on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi in Libya. Six hours into the attack, President Obama spoke via telephone with Secretary Clinton, and it was decided no rescue would be attempted. The next morning, Clinton's State Department blamed the attack on a video insulting Islam and sent memos to YouTube and Google to censor speech insulting Islam. When it was uncovered that the attacks had nothing to do with the video, Secretary Clinton said, what difference does it make? When her emails surfaced, it was revealed that U.S. Stinger missiles had made their way from Benghazi to Afghan Taliban, who used them to shoot down a U.S. C-130 and armed Syrian terrorists to remove President Assad. Syria's Christian population went from 2.5 million to just a few hundred thousand. The New York Post, June 18, 2014, reported, the Obama administration isn't only giving the Taliban back its commanders, it's giving them weapons. Obama's arming of Islamists was reported by the Los Angeles Times, March 27, 2016. In Syria, militias armed by the Pentagon fight those armed by the CIA. Pushing back on this was Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who introduced the Stop Arming Terrorist Act. The New York Times reported, July 29th to 2017, President Trump has ended the clandestine American program to provide arms and supplies to the Syrian rebel groups. Time Magazine reported June 28th, 2017, President Trump ends covert plan to arm Syrian rebels. In 2021, the Biden administration withdrew from Afghanistan, allowing China to move in for rare earth metals and lithium for batteries. Over $85 billion worth of weapons were left for the Taliban, including Black Hawk helicopters and 600,000 weapons. Many of these weapons reportedly were used by Hamas to attack Israel on October 7, 2023. Biden allowed Iran to make billions through oil sales and gave them billions in a September 11th prisoner exchange. Some reports claim that weapons the U.S. supplied to Ukraine's Neo-Nazi group Azov have also found their way to Hamas to attack Israel. Much prayer is being offered for Israel. An inspiring story is that of Mossab Hassan Yosef, the son of Hamas co-founder. Yosef grew up in Palestine and saw how ruthlessly Hamas terrorized civilians. From 1997 to 2007, Yusef secretly warned Israelis of, the, of impending suicide attacks to save their lives. He eventually became a Christian and escaped to America. Yosef explained in a CBN interview, May 22nd, 2010, my problem is with the God of the Quran. If we compare his personality to the God of the Bible, we find the difference. From their fruits, we shall know them. The fruits of the God of the Quran is terrorism, beating women, killing children. My transformation took six years of study. It was not overnight. I had to study Christianity and other religions. I considered at some point not to believe in any religion. The only path I found peace, which was good for me and good for all mankind, was Jesus Christ. An amazing statement by the son of the founder of Hamas. Well, I hope this episode of How We Got Here is interesting to you. God bless you.